I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I have been working on uh, the classification of the orthogonal Schaeffer polynomials, uh, trying to understand uh, various papers about that. And today, John Harland uh, will teach me uh, about moments and um, help me to understand how to uh, get a probability distribution uh, from the moments. So uh, his uh, PhD is in functional analysis. Mine is in algebraic combinatorics. So I really appreciate uh, his tutoring. Hi, John. Oh, hi. OK, so uh, this is going to be rough. I mean, I'm just sort of um, shooting from the hip here. So I, I don't promise anything polished. Distribution from the moments. So the question is, can you get, you know, given any distribution, you can always write out the moments um, mm -hmm. and not that you're guaranteed that they're finite, but you can write out, you know, moments, say, a n. Uh, is a n a good uh, letter for the sure. moments? Or to, That'll okay. be fine. Yeah. Okay. I actually, and mu mu sub n might be best. Right. Or okay. you, yeah. however you like. Yeah. Mu sub n is equal to, uh, suppose it's just a single variable, but it's, it could be multivariable also. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be uh, x to the n uh, f of x. And do you want to write the, the density function as f of x or p of x? Or how do you want to write that? Or w of x or however. p of x? Like a weight. It's like a weight function, right? Weight or function. So, so w of x? Yeah. OK. OK. Mm -hmm. So these are the moments. Now, the deal is, is that, you know, these moments might not even exist. They might be infinite, uh, depending on this weight function, this weight function mm -hmm. uh, uh, very quickly at infinity, uh, then the weight functions, the, these weights may not exist. Um, on the other hand, if you have a weight function like a Gaussian, all all of the moments will exist. Mm -hmm. And so we have to kind of make some some assumptions here. And so we're going to make some rather crude assumptions about W of X. Um, in particular, I think the best crude assumption to make, you know, at least as a first cut is to assume it's a Schwartz function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and please remind me what a Schwartz function is. It's sorry. Schwartz functions are the set of functions. Uh, is it square integrable or is it? Oh, uh, no, no, that, that would be the L2 functions. That's a oh, much, much larger class of functions. Uh, but the Schwartz functions are um, that uh, F is infinitely differentiable. Mm-hmm. So C infinity and, right. and um, this is bounded. So uh, say, you know, the soup of, of um, X to the N F of X, where X ranges over the entire real mm -hmm. line is bounded. So it's going down like exponentially at the, towards infinity, among other things. So it's got to be, yeah, so... ...exponential and polynomial. Um, but so, in other words, we're saying that F dies faster. Mm -hmm. Right. So in other words, it's pretty, it's 
controlled. It's very controlled uh, at infinity. And in particular, uh, the set of norms um, the semi norms, you know, um, and actually, what I should, you know, even more severely than this, I'm sorry, um, any derivative. So, so it's not only, that, but it's also all of its derivatives have this property mm -hmm. for all n and m. So F, the derivative So every derivative um, of F dies faster than a polynomial at infinity, mm -hmm. any polynomial at infinity. So the semi-norms, you know, on S. Um, so you can define these semi-norms. Uh, Something like this. I mean, you can define them in various ways, but one way of defining them is like this. Mm -hmm. hmm. And what they do is they endow, I mean, this is a little bit of an aside, but they endow the short space. It's called the short space. And they endow the short space uh, with a um, um, with a topological vector space topology. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's a metrizable topology. Um, the metric you could just take and sum up all these semi norms uh, with coefficients in front to make them converge. Mm -hmm. And um, and you can uh, oh I don't know the metric I, I mean there's there, there's ways of of cluting up a metric so this is actually a metric space it's not it's not that exotic in terms of point set topology anyway. This is, um, you know, this is extremely powerful space of functions for probing uh, differential equations and um, mm -hmm. looking at various properties of functions. And it turns out that, you know, mm -hmm. including L2, all the LP spaces, and so forth. Um, and so, so if you want to probe something, you know, and you don't want to deal with non-differentiability, you don't, you, you want controlled infinity, then, then the mm -hmm. short space is, is a good space to do a first first cut probing. So that's what we're going to do in, in terms of analyzing this problem. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you have these moments and W is in the short space, do they determine W? And uh, if not, what are some additional restrictions that we could put on W to um, make this a unique determination? In other words, figure out how to recover W from the moments. Um, and so, so the first question we're going to address is, um, well, the, the thing to note is that 
if W is in the short space, then all UN exists in our finite. Okay, because you can take the integral. You can. That's right. The thing dies faster than any polynomial. So, in particular, it dies faster than x to the uh, n plus two at infinity. So, and this mm -hmm. is bound. This is this. This is going to be. Um, you know, this divided by one plus x x to the n plus two is going to be is going to be bounded, and therefore. Uh, this thing dies fast, so therefore it's integrable, and you got to find that. And so, and so, and so, just to speak up about a couple of examples um, that are relevant for the Sheff polynomial. So, uh, in the case of the Hermite polynomials, the weight function is something like e to the negative one half x squared, and so that's a bell-shaped curve, and and so. Uh, that'll, uh, you know, that's you can hit okay. it with any polynomial, it'll basically still have the same behavior towards infinity. So that's one example of a weight function. And another one, uh, and that would go from negative infinity to positive infinity. And another one is for the Laguerre, um, it looks like x to the alpha times e to the negative x. So e to the negative x has it goes down uh, as you go to positive infinity. But the, the domain uh, is starts at zero, so you go from zero to negative infinity. So and yeah. then if it's negative, then it's just not uh, it's not there. So uh, so those are two examples. Yeah. So so I mean, yeah. So I'm not sure how this would. I mean, you'd have to adapt this in order to deal mm -hmm. with that with with that um, weight function because it's not from negative infinity to positive infinity. So we'd have to think about you know what. You know whether this would apply or not, but mm -hmm. but anyway, let's just let's go ahead and assume you know like the Gaussians obviously you know right is is obvious example and then then the other I, I guess like for the general case of the weight function of the Meixner how it'll be it'll be I think it'll be something like x to the k, it's a step function, which goes as x to the k over k factorial, which is basically like e to the, hmm. And then, but it's also multiplied by this falling factorial. So somehow, um, anyways, we'll get there. Yeah. But uh, yeah. so these step functions can work like, um, they can maybe be versions of um, similar to the, um, bell curve similar to the gaussian yeah well anyway let's let's, mm -hmm. let's carry through you know and you know like i say this is the first cut kind of kind of analysis and then to apply to more general classes right you have to you, you'd have to do some work to see mm -hmm. whether this kind of thing generalize so the question is Okay, so let's let's uh let's list a question. So assuming that W is sufficiently regular to be in the Schwartz space, um, does the sequence of moments determine w right okay and so the answer <laughs> so even if you assume this kind of regularity the answer is resoundingly no oh okay so <laughs> Hey, that's not fair, John. Oh, hell to, no. To be, <laughs> no, no. In fact, these moments, these, you know, the moments, um, you know, there's there's been extensive mathematical research on like when does a sequence um, mm -hmm. can be written like moment, you know, like a right. you know, given a given a, a a sequence of moments, when can you find a W? And right. that, 
that's been kind of figured out, you know, over, you know, that, I mean, that was an age old problem and there's been some very satisfactory solutions of that. Um, and, you know, it's a rather pretty problem. Um, and so you'd see that in a, like a graduate level analysis book or something. Um, so, uh, but the, but in general, there's not just one weight function that would do mm -hmm. this. You know, there might exist a weight function. In general, there would be a whole, you know, some whole manifold of weight functions that would would fill the bill. Okay, so, so it's not unique. There could so be. It's not necessarily unique unless you impose additional conditions. And we're going to see that, you know, one such additional condition you can impose is analyticity or real analyticity. Um, okay, and so so when you say determine, it doesn't mean that uh, it doesn't exist. It means that there could be many of them that's right. that are different. That's right. Now it turns out that a Gaussian or something that that is you know real analytic, you know, the answer is going to be yes. Okay. But that's extremely much more <laughs> restricted than just a Schwartz function. Mm -hmm. So so let's let's take a look at this condition and let's um, let's kind of massage this a bit. Um, I mean, look at this relationship. Um, and so I want to rewrite this in terms of a Fourier transform. Um, mm -hmm. and then it, things become much clearer when you, when you rewrite it, um, as a Fourier transform. So First of all, I want to point out that um, that this itself is a Schwartz function. This integrand is Schwartz, mm -hmm. and so for any Schwartz function, the integral of f is actually equal to the Fourier transform evaluated at zero. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, um, I have to state some facts about Fourier transforms. Please. Um, So the, the forward and backward Fourier transforms of F are also an S and vice versa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's nice that the Fourier transform uh, preserves the Schwartz space. Now it also preserves L2. The Fourier transform is an isometry on L2. It, it, it doesn't, it, and, and maybe please, uh, just for me and for other viewers, uh, please uh, write down the definition of the Fourier transform. Yeah. So this is a mathematician's definition. Um, everything, all, all the integrals are assumed to go from negative infinity to infinity. So this is going to be okay. f of x e to the minus 2 pi i. I'm sorry. Let me get my variable straight. Right, then it's C. My computer kind of hung up. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. That looks like some kind of primitive uh, creature from the yeah, Cambrian period. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's a that's a definition for you transform. And, and that letter, that Greek letter, is how do you pronounce it? I, I guess zeta. Let's let's use a zeta. Okay, zeta. Okay. Okay. So, so that's a mathematician's for you transform. The physicist doesn't have the two pi in there, um, mm -hmm. but then they have to normalize with the one over the square root of two pi or something. It, it's you know I'd rather mm -hmm. use the mathematician's definition. I'm just more mm -hmm. used. Um, and. So it's a Fourier transform. So that means if you just put in a zero, you get f of x e to the zero dx. 
which is equal to the integral of f of x dx. So you can see that the Fourier transform evaluates. Oh, I see. Here. That's interesting. Okay, so that's uh, that's interesting. So actually, I can just er erase this. That's a very interesting way to think of it because then it says that the Fourier transform is kind of like taking the integral and then uh, evolving away from it. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's so it's and, by, a, it's and, a, and through this periodic through this yeah. periodic engine inside that's kind of like a no I like I, I like that and, and in fact that's a looking at um time propagation of you know like um like a you know that's that's a, you know an excellent way of you can write out you know for example like for a free space wave function mm -hmm. you can write out the time the time dependence of it in terms of a Fourier transform and it, it makes it very clear um in terms of the time evolution so yeah it's a it's a powerful way of thinking about Fourier transform um so and I'm assuming you've seen this stuff before this is like you know a little bit you know I mean you know, it's kind of it's not kind of like thrown, <laughs> thrown at us rapid fire and analysis yeah. you know just like any other thing unless you live with it for a while it it doesn't you know it doesn't really become second nature so um but analysts love the Fourier transform it does so many nice things for us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so anyway this is um something else here um uh so you can write f by the Fourier inversion theorem which applies to all L2 functions. Um, mm -hmm. Well, at least to all, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Like, you know, the, the, the Fourier transform is an isometry of L2. That's that's like the Plancherel theorem. So that's the crowning kind of theorem in, in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in, Fourier, in Fourier transforms. It's like super important. And, but the thing is the Fourier transform doesn't, you know, in this form here, you can't just plug in an, L, an arbitrary L2 function. This integral doesn't convert. This. Mm. Abstract extension to all of L2. So this, you know, it, it's kind of, the, the formula is rather kludgy. It only, it only works for a dense subspace of L2. Mm. But the nice thing about Schwartz space, you don't have to worry about any of that crap. It, everything converges and everything converges absolutely and mm -hmm. it's finite. So, you know, it's one of the one one of the very nice things about Schwartz spaces that for convergence, you know, derivatives and integrals and all that stuff, you never have to worry about convergence. But by the Fourier inversion theorem, um, um, you know, f of x can be written as the Fourier transform of its Fourier the inverse Fourier transform. Oh, okay. And you can write that. It's the inverse Fourier transform mm -hmm. evaluated. Mm -hmm. So there's all you know, there's also this incredibly nice property. And okay. So notice that um so Notice that um, what am I trying to get at here? Um, so what I want to do is I want to claim, you know, just off the side here, what I want to claim is that x to the n f of x dx is actually proportional to uh, the nth derivative Ah, no. Equals a constant times the nth derivative
So, you know, the zeroth derivative is just the, mm -hmm. the, I'm sorry, the integral is just the zeroth derivative of the Fourier transform evaluated at zero. So what I want to mm -hmm. do is Um, is generalize this to this formula. Mm. So mm -hmm. that's just a little side note to remind myself where we're going with this. And so, no, why is this the case? So what but I want to do And derivative is... with regard to what? With regards to... Um, with regard to the variable. Um, and the variable is... Uh... Okay, so let me let me write this out. So it's just going to be... Right. Evaluate it c equals zero. Okay. And that's uh and so that's showing how um the nth derivative and the uh, multiplying by x to the n, how they are um dual, I guess, in some sense. Yeah, how they're um, related. And so then in the have, yeah, so I mean it, it it's it's pretty clear that um for example, when I take the derivative, mm -hmm. uh so I want to be very careful here. Um, yeah, I mean, we could do integration by parts. I kind of don't want to do that. Um, let me let me write out these two formulas. But it here. just it just reminds me. Uh, so one week ago, uh, you were uh, you and uh, Thomas and I were talking, and um, there was this idea especially with regard to Hamiltonian and energy about the raising and lowering operators and how they work together. Uh, and so this is very much those raising, lowering operators. At least it looks very similar to me. Yeah. Um, well, let's see, what is the connection there? Um, well, that like the raising would be... Um, I think the multiplying by x was a raising operator. Oh, like, right, you know, right. you're creating a compartment, mm -hmm. taking the derivative like you're um, choosing a compartment. So, um, you know, so um, the power yeah, gets lowered yeah, by yeah. taking the derivative. The multiplying by x raises the power. If you if you're working with polynomials, um, the operative thing there is that the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. So you know the the mm -hmm. So I think that that plays in there when you're talking about the Harmonic Oscillator. Mm -hmm. So um, basically the Hermite, uh, I should, no, no, I, I should I should say something more precise here. The, the Hermite polynomials or Hermite polynomials or Hermite functions are the eigenfunctions of the Fourier transform. That's That's really what I mean. So, I'll say that again. So the Hermite polynomial, the Hermite eigenfunctions. The Hermite functions. You know the, the Hermite functions. So that would include a square root of the weight yep. function. Yeah, that's or, right. That's right. Um, those are the eigenfunctions of the Fourier transform. So that's for, in which, like, just uh, in the big picture, like. No, I mean that's they, you know it turns out that if you ask what are the eigenfunctions of the Fourier the Fourier transform is a unitary transform on L two, right? So, oh, it's got to have some eigenfunctions, you know, like every unitary. Oh, operator. so those are really special. Yeah, yeah. So okay. So okay. so when you multiply by x, um, it's the same as the Fourier transform. It, it's of the same function differentiated in other words mm -hmm. you know because these two functions are the same mm -hmm. um you know you get this you get this um symmetry between multiplying by x or x squared and differentiating twice by x okay okay and so that just happens because the fourier transform of the hermite functions are are themselves times a constant and the constant i think is Plus or minus one. I'm glad you said that. And then that's uh, that's or plus or minus I. Yeah. Appreciate for me to appreciate. Yeah. 
And so then, that's, then, yeah, so then, yes, there's definitely a connection there, but it's only it's only for the harmonic. Um, yeah, but the hermite are the trivial case, and then everything else is kind of like extending it in certain ways. And so it's interesting. It'll be interesting to think like, well, how are these different other cases extending that? What does that mean for what you just said? So that's just notching that for the future to think about. Yeah, let's take a, let's take the derivative of know this sucker. Okay, so because everything converges um, like super fast, you can bring the derivative inside the integral. And I'm sorry, what I meant is this: mm -hmm. you can bring the derivative inside the integral. It's by the dominated convergence theorem or something. We both okay. took a real analysis uh, course in graduate school at UCSD. And so that was like 30 something years ago. Yeah. And, that was and so I'm, I really like that course. I, 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 I super enjoyed Linda, Linda's teaching. Um, Linda, what was her last name? Linda Rothschild. Um, Rothschild. Rothschild. And uh, you were stellar. I mean, so I was so yeah, impressed that you would talk to her and you had all this intuition. You would ask these questions. She was impressed. <laughs> I probably had some background. Like, I think I, 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 you know, st been studying analysis. So I, I might've had a leg up, you know? Yeah. And you had an engineering background too, like kind of like, you know, so f with your, you know, more, more analytic insight, uh, but I'm just, so I'm just digging back to that class. <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. but uh so it's exciting uh to yeah yeah this is the same, it's the same stuff but you know i i've i've worked with Fourier transforms you know a lot since that time so yes. a hardwired you know a lot of this stuff um is you know kind of um you know uh, at least so you know but again well, and Understand. And I know that you, know, you always uh, relate to this in quantum mechanics with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and with all oh, like, yeah. you know, you, it's yeah. your go to picture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, it's all, it's all, uh, you know, intrinsic, you know, intrinsic and in basic quantum mechanics. And the problem with quantum mechanics is that, you know, they teach it, you know, it's taught to undergraduates and they mm -hmm. don't have this stuff hardwired. So it's really kind of, you know, it's at a different mathematical level than most undergraduates have seen before. Yeah, it's kind of that, mystical. Yeah. That, disturbed, that disturbed me a lot. It's one of the, one of my motivations for studying analysis. Mm. Uh, but now that I know the analysis and all the math, it's quantum is still mysterious to me. So there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so um, here we go. So you're taking a derivative now. That's, That's coming derivative. down. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So yeah, you just take the derivative of the exponential there. And it's yeah. interesting. So that derivative is with regard to uh, zeta, right? Although the integral is with regard to dx. So. Right. So it's just one of the magic things that's about the Fourier mm -hmm. transform. Um, I see. And so that was something that didn't register with me. Like, so here it's very clear how the um, X comes down. It's because it's differentiating by a different uh, variable. And so I, I didn't kind of catch that, uh, that, you know, you're differentiating in one world with one variable, but you're multiplying by X, you know, that's another variable in, you know, in the integral. Then that makes sense how they balance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because okay. if it was the okay. same integral, I couldn't really figure what's going on. I mean, the same variable. <laughs> I don't understand. But now I so, have so, a better, better sense. Okay. So are we good? Yeah. Please. Okay. So so let's let's go ahead and take the nth derivative. Of course, it's going to be exactly the same kind of computation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's nice. Okay, so so that's our general, and so we're seeing this moment. Um, 
Oh, and that's the moment. Oh, you so, you, you you sneaked up on me. <laughs> so I was wa- I was wondering. <laughs> Just yeah, let him go where he going. takes yeah. me. I was, he took me there. <laughs> so, I was also kind of wondering where we were going, but I'm I'm not <laughs> writing this out correctly. Um, so, okay. you know, I'm making mistakes as I'm writing them down. So I, I have to I corrected that. So that means that if we set um, zeta equal to zero, we get negative two pi i. Mm-hmm. And, and that's interesting. That factor. That's uh, that's important factor, I guess. Okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the factor is the factor is there, and this is mu. Okay, that means mu n hmm. is equal to the if you have a Schwartz function. Again, we're assuming regularity here, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so uh, so this is one over two pi i, or negative two pi i to the nth power. Mm-hmm. The derivative of the um, Fourier transform evaluated at zero. Oh. So we could just maybe write that a little more compactly. Okay, so this is saying that from the Fourier transform, we can get the moments then we're going to try to flip this around. Is that right? Or... Yeah. So basically, you giving me the moments is the same thing as you giving me the um, the derivatives of the Fourier transform evaluated at zero. Mm-hmm. So this question is. Question one. Did I call this question one? Yeah. Question one becomes at least for Schwartz functions. Question one becomes um, can we determine? The Fourier transform from the derivatives of the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform would be the, I guess, integrating the against the weight function. Is that right? Or no, we have to go back to the Fourier. Is the four? Oh no, no. Um, I'm sorry. We should. The Fourier transform of the wave function from its derivatives. Mm-hmm. So let's think about what this means. Um, so because um, W and the Fourier transform determine one another. Mm-hmm. So if you want to know, can you determine W from the weights, it's equivalent to saying, can you determine its Fourier transform from the weights, but the weights are related to the Fourier transform, the derivative. Okay, okay so just, just for me to catch up, so if we can, the the connection between the weights and the Fourier transform for the weights is very nice. And if we could get to there, we're set, right? But but we have to get to, like you're saying, uh, can we get, can we determine the 
Fourier transform of the weight function from the derivatives of that Fourier transform evaluated at zero. Right. So this reminds us of Taylor series, right? Yeah. So let, let's just, let's state this in general. So W is just some arbitrary Schwartz function. Form to some Schwartz space, and so, and and vice versa. Um, well, I mean, so the Schwartz Fourier transform preserves the Schwartz space. So we want to know. If f is an S, do f at zero determine f? W is an arbitrary Schwartz function. Therefore, the Fourier transform is an arbitrary Schwartz function. We want to know is the Fourier mm -hmm. transform uh, determined by its derivatives at zero, and therefore. Mm -hmm. just for any Schwartz function, is it determined by, was it zero? And the answer is no. <laughs> and it's easy to see, for example, um, if you let, say, this be this cutoff function, um, zero, when X is equal to zero and one, I mean, you might've seen this before. Schwartz functions are, are you know, it, it seems like a, it seems like a really severe um, mm -hmm. restriction, you know, saying that all the derivatives have to exist and, you know, so it's C infinity and then it has this regularity at, at, mm -hmm. uh, at infinity, but it turns out that they're super flexible. You can create all kinds of, all kinds of shapes. Um, Mm -hmm. you can... all kinds of bad shapes <laughs> so you can see that you know for most of its life it hangs out around well when x is large it looks like e to the one over large so e to the zero so for the most part, um, it looks like it's one, except for then it takes a dive down towards zero and is super flat, infinitely mm -hmm. flat as you pass zero. All the derivatives vanish. Mm -hmm. So. Um, okay, so just, just to state what's obvious to you, but maybe. So e to the negative one over x squared, when x is tiny, um, then x squared is even tinier and positive. And then e to the negative of a tiny number uh, is going to be, um, let's see. No, it's going to be, if, let, me, let me turn around. One over, one over a tiny number is e, going to be huge. It's going to be e to the negative huge number. Yeah, and so e to the negative of this huge number will be z basically almost zero. So it's going to be very close to zero when you when when x becomes small. Okay, but when x is big, uh, then let's see what happens. When x is big, then then if oh it approaches one, is that right? Right, right. Okay, this goes to one, and so the integral is will not be bounded, right? Oh no, no, it's not. But this is a this is a, this is not a Schwartz function. Um, it's a C infinity function. Okay. Evaluated zero or equal to zero. So. 
So the function in all its derivatives vanish at zero. Mm -hmm. So well, so if I let f of x equal this times, say, the Gaussian. Right. Then that's a Schwartz function. And, and this is a Schwartz function. And all its derivatives vanish at zero. Oh, so you're saying this is something where all the derivatives are zero, but it's not the zero function. Yeah. Okay, I got it. <laughs> so. so let's call this G, just so we can relate to, um, no, nah, let's call it, let's call it G, because we're kind of talking in the Fourier domain here. Okay, and then let me just, uh, let me just say what I surmise is that uh, if your function can be expressed as a Taylor series or like a Maclaurin series, you know, around zero, right? Then, uh, then well, then uh, it's determined by uh, all these f prime, you know, f yes. prime of zeros. Is that right? So right, that's right. So so in that that's the case where we would be happy, right? Like so, if our function was a Maclaurin series then we would be set. But this is, for example, what you've just shown is that that doesn't have a Maclaurin series. It can't because uh, e to the ne ne negative x squared is too, that one over x squared is just too severe. It can't be modeled. That's the gist of it. Is that, yeah. am I on track? Okay. Hanging in there. <laughs> okay, so G of it. Okay, so zero, so if, right. Okay, so all the, all the, all the moments all are its, zero. All of its moments are zero because it's Fourier transform, the, the derivatives of its Fourier transform vanish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But W is not the zero function. Uh, in fact, um, if um, if the weights are given, And W has those weights. Then so does W plus fan transform of G. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because all the weights of G are zero of, right. of or at least the inverse for transform of G. So, so we've come up with a function, basically. You've come up with whole universe of functions, basically. Uh, you're a function whose weights are all zero. I mean, who's, mm -hmm. who's, uh, who's all zero, and we did. So, and then you can add that to any, to any right. function with those weights, with, with, those, with those moments, rather. I don't, I say weights, but I meant moments. Um, and then you'll get a, another function. Mm -hmm. So moments, I should scratch that up, moments. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So what's going on here, you know, here's the problem. is that S is not specific enough. The Schwartz space. Yeah. It's got too much stuff in it. In particular, it's got these weird functions, these weird cutoff functions in it. Right. Whose derivatives vanish everywhere. Now, this can't happen with an analytic function, as you pointed out, if you've got a Taylor series. So thus, Okay, and so that's what real analytic means is having these series, right? 
just like complex and analytic would have that type of infinite yeah. series. Is that right? So that's right. Okay. So we're going to look at Schwartz functions that are real analytic. Okay. And let's call this. So it can't, and, and just to kind of state maybe the obvious, but like you can't look at all real analytic functions because a lot of them, like parabolas or something, they go to infinity. So right. uh, yeah. you have to find those that uh, have all those nice properties, like you were saying, where they, uh, uh, they, they go off down. Yeah. That's right. Like e to the minus x squared is an example. And what that shows, uh, so I think part of the deal there is that, um, let's see. I guess at higher powers or so, like, you know, like you can have different uh, coefficients and those coefficients can somehow. Um, hmm. They have to grow in the right way, I guess. I, I guess that's all I can say. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, so the sequence of coefficients, I mean, it, it's, yeah, so, I mean, uh, there, there, I think there's a lot of interesting questions that are related to this, like, you know, exactly, mm -hmm. you know, can you, can you identify so somehow intrinsically the sequence of moments, you know, the moment sequence, um, that belongs to real analytic functions? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that that's that's a really interesting question. I I don't know what the answer. Well, state is. that question again. How would you state can, that question? Can you you know, in other words, we're not talking about any old moments. We're talking about moments of real analytic functions now. Right. And so, and then the question is: Are those moment sequences? Um somehow restricted in, in an intrinsic way um, by by um, demanding real analyticity and being in the short space and so yeah I so that that's that's something I'd I'd have to think about or research mm -hmm. you know I mean my guess is you know it's a, it's a really interesting question but right my guess is there is a literature on that because it's so it's such a basic question. Um, but yeah, um, it might actually have a very easy answer. So, uh, or it could have an incredibly hard answer. I don't know. Um, so, so basically, you know, your Taylor series tells you how to put these moment, how to put these derivatives together. Um, and so, uh, for the weight, if if it's for a transform is in, you know, first of all, does that mean that W is in the set of Schwartz functions that are real analytic? I don't know. Again, you know, an interesting basic question that, that I don't, I'm not sure what the answer is, but it certainly is an interesting question. And, but if you assume that the, that the, The, the the Fourier transform of of W is in A, which is a set of analytic Schwartz functions. Mm -hmm. um, then then uh, the U N do determine the the moments do determine W, and not only that, you have an explicit expression for the where you transform
So let's see. This is the exciting part. This is what I've been waiting for, I think, right? Yeah. So this is you're the gonna form give me a formula. Formula. Now we just yeah, I'm gonna give you a formula. So it's gonna be um negative. And it's gonna uniquely determine, I think. Yeah, uh, so we're gonna use that right there. there. So so this is gonna be um negative two pi n times the weights. Okay, so that is the no, but it's almost the formula. So that's the nth derivative of the der Oh, it's the, the sum. Derivative. It's yeah. the sum. That's interesting. Over n factorial. Oh, very interesting. So that's our that's our formula. So the moments are basically like the coefficients of the with negative two pi i to the n, right? So that's very oh, you know, that's very interesting. Um very interesting. See that i is very interesting because uh with if n is even, then the i pops out, you know, becomes a negative one. Uh and uh we'll be able to take, you know, when you when you have kind of told me all this, we'll be able to look at the actual moment uh moments and the moment generating functions for the um orthogonal Sheffer polynomials. Mm -hmm. And there's a very special thing where like uh when the wave function collapses, well, with the Hermite case, uh, you get uh, only the um, even powers, and then um, and then also you only get the even powers when they're entangled. Furthermore, the odd powers drop out. So that'll be interesting to compare to this. Yeah. And yeah, you have to assume real analyticity. Um, so the question is, so we're assuming that, you know, this is a condition here. Now, what condition does that impose on W? And again, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> and not only that, you know, what does this have to, you know, what, you know, is there some kind of intrinsic formulation of moments such that this would be the case and um so anyway this just you know this just scratches the surface of of maybe what you need to be able to oh this is very good and it's very interesting to have you just unfold the topic because <laughs> you're a legit you know like you're kind of like uh, a traffic engineer, like someone designing a road system and you care about the traffic rules and everything has to be, you know, all the cars have to stay on the road, etc. I'm just like, what, looking for a go-kart. <laughs> well, like, that's what you get from, that's what you get from now. I mean, math you know, does that. Right, I, <laughs> I just want to, just want to get to it. So I'm waiting for this formula, you know, yeah. but um, it's a beautiful formula. I'm still trying to absorb it, but I wanted to riff on one thing, um, an idea that I've been thinking about, um, I've started this this, this video series yeah, on. Hang um, on a second. Let me. I just want to check my formula. Go ahead. Yeah, you check your formula, but I'll tell this uh, story uh, uh, that I'm making these videos about math discovery and like the 24 ways of figuring things out in mathematics. And uh, inside these ways, uh, there's an algebraic wing of this mansion of ways, and there's like an analytic wing, and um, they're connected by this three cycle. And what the what I'm kind of realizing is, is like, there's this uh, algebra and analysis kind of have this uh, worlds in parallel, and there's this symmetry between them. And so there's symmetry on either side, but like total symmetry in algebra, I, I'm thinking is kind of like a circle, and total symmetry in analysis is like uh, the function e to the I theta, let's say. So e to the I theta, in, the reason I say that is, uh, well, or just e to the x, let's say, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. So there's this like this total symmetry. Um, but the, the the symmetry of a circle is kind of, you know, is, is the rotations of the circle is kind of like the basis for all the discrete symmetry that you end up having. And there's some kind of deep connection between, you know, the circle and e to the x. Well, because of like what you just have here, like e to the 2 pi i x. When you look at it in complexes, it's rotating. 
Well, and isn't, then, that, um, isn't, isn't that like basic Lee group theory? Like, um, yeah, that's another point because it's bridging well, the it's bridging the Lie algebra and the Lie group. Right. I mean, I mean, and then another thing, circle is a Lie group, right? And uh, um, right, Lie group then, is exponential. Exactly right. And then if you look at um, well, it, like one well, of the things well, that, if you look at the characters. Um, you know, if you look at the irreducible representations, I believe, well, you can look at it from a point of view of one parameter Lie group, or you can look at irreducible representations of the Lie group. I mean, there's a lot of different ways of looking at right. it, but the exponentials come out naturally. Um, yeah, and then and, and the whole point being that, like like you're saying, like Lie groups are both groups and uh, analytical, you know, like um, well, manifold. So um so they're combining this these things are happening in parallel but just to extend on that um, i'm trying to understand lie groups and as a foundations for geometries but one exciting thing i noticed was that uh, to study lie groups you have to look at their um maximal torus let's say and that maximal torus is um it's a diagonal uh, matrices of rotations and there's very few ways to do those rotations and they're very simple like so in the in the case of the special unitary they're going to be e to the i theta they'll be complex rotations but in the case of the orthogonal matrices Matrix, the special the orthogonal, special orthogonal group uh, they're going to be two by two rotations you know with cosines and sines and that explains why um if you have an odd dimensional uh, special orthogonal group you see you you have two by two matrices so you'll have an extra dimension like an extra axis that's fixed but if you have an even dimension, you know, it'll be a basically different story, you know, that'll all be used up. So that's why those two cases split. And then in the in the quaternion case, in the symplectic group case, uh, the way you do a rotation is you you have a, a, a sub group of the quaternions, you, like you thought so the quaternions would be like one I, J, K. So it might be, let's say one and I would be a rotation subgroup in the quaternion. So those are the ways that you can write rotations. Those are the ways that you can form this maximal torus. And those are the ways that you can uh, create these different Lie groups. And that's very limited, you know, and that seems to be like one of the uh, found bases for, you know, one of the starting points for where this happens. And just to add um, the related thought is that, uh, so rotations are super basic in terms of uh, uh, these and and so what what why is rotations important uh, in geometry and in math and stuff? When I do the math discovery, basically it's like you have two ways of looking at things. You can either say I have a sheet of paper and I'm going to work on that one sheet at a time. So like it's going to have a center, like an origin in that sheet. You find the best origin. You find some kind of parity or balance. You find different, uh, like a set of different solutions. Let's say you find a list, like a vector space of how to build it out, whatever. But you, it's all on one sheet. Or with analysis, like you can go through a bunch of sheets. You know, so like you can find like the, you can do induction. You can find like a minimum or maximum. You can do like a least or uh, upper bound, greatest lower bound. You can get a limit. And but that's all kind of like not doing a single sheet. It's like doing the sequence of sheets. So the point being that like a sheet has an origin an origin is for rotations and then when these two systems come together you have like uh, ways like there's four ways to think geometrically logically but basically there's a uh, one where you do uh zero origins or sheets one origin or sheet two origins or sheets or three origins or sheets and basically so it's like doing like zero rotations one rotation two rotation three rotation you have these different systems where just to finish the thought, like uh, you can do mathematical proofs, like proof by contradiction, where you don't need any kind of sheet. But if you did, and that'd be like maybe like affine geometry has no origin, let's say. But in projective geometry, like you have one origin in projective geometry. In conformal geometry, you can have like rotations. You have two, and then in in symplectic, like you have a one space with an origin. You take another space, you can move it off, and it'll meet up with a third space. Like you'll have a translation. So all I'm saying is that. This idea of rotations, which is crept up in here, you know, this negative two pi i to the n and stuff, like that's just permeating algebra analysis uh, geometry. It's uh, it's kind of on my mind.
How's your formula? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at pick up a book on doing analysis on Lie groups. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is all the all this stuff is very intrinsic. Like this, you know, we've done everything in R one, you know, but a lot of this stuff carries through to um, arbitrary Lie groups. You you can, you know, you have Fourier, you know, you have Fourier series. Um, uh, you know, and, and basically the EDI theta, uh, uh, you know, the EDI X functions are, are what are called characters and you can expand any, oh, 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 you can expand oh, oh. any, any function, you know, any L2 function in terms of those characters. So you get a Fourier expansion on Lie groups. So Fourier analysis generalizes to Lie groups. Um, and this is just thank one. you for yeah. thank you for like walking me through like this forest yeah, so, because uh, and then and I then just wouldn't walk in this forest by myself. <laughs> you know, like yeah, yeah. So, so, you, so like Audrey Terrace, remember she was a mathematician at UCSD. She was an expert at Fourier analysis on finite groups, and a lot of the stuff that it, she was true. a number theorist. Is that right? Or yeah, she was a number theorist, but okay. she got very interested in Fourier analysis on finite groups because. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, things like random number generators can be explained, um, mm -hmm. you know, how they converge and so forth um, by doing Fourier analysis on finite groups. Um, and um, and then there's also like the Riemann hypothesis on finite fields mm -hmm. that's related. Um, so so she wrote a book on on Fourier analysis on finite groups, but I think it, a lot of it is looks you know, in at least formally, like Fourier analysis on Lie groups, um, and so yeah, that's a, you know, that's a, um, a very, um, you know, it's very important in analysis, and it's you know Fourier analysis. You know, like because. Of what we, we we just did um so, uh, so yeah. just to just to re so you brought me to this formula which is the one i wanted with my go-kart <laughs> i can soon get into this and in the in the so what is it saying saying if i know all my moments then basically i'm constructing like a uh like a taylor series and a mclaurin series right uh in in this uh zeta power I yeah. got my n factorial I got my z to the n and then all I got to do is multiply negative 2 pi i to the n times moment right right and that's exciting because that uh, must very much fit with you know what I'll show you uh in terms of the actual moments that we get like the actual Taylor series that we get uh uh oh because you know why because what I did which is very um uh, auspicious, I guess, or very appropriate. Like, I was curious to say, hmm, what would the generating functions for the moments look like, right? So, you know, if I have the moments, well, what if I took a t to the n and an n factorial, right? A mo moment over the n factorial times t to the n and summed it all up, what would be the function? So I don't have that negative two pi i but I have everything else, and I I, yeah. they, I looked them all up because, and the way I was able to do that is because these um, moments that I get, you know, that we get with the orthogonal shift for polynomials, they're all beautiful, classic, uh, famous uh, combinatorial counting numbers. Right. Yeah. So those counting numbers all have generating exponential generating functions, right? Yeah. And so an example would be like um, if the moments for the Laguerre they're just uh, n factorial. So what you get. You get n factorial over n factorial. That cancels. You just get the sum of t to the n, which is uh, 1 over 1 minus t. So 1 over 1 minus t is the generating function for the moments for the Laguerre. It's that simple. Hmm. This does seem, yeah, this does, does seem very much related. Um, and yeah, you can see that, uh, yeah, I can see why you're. Oh, 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 oh. And see, the deal is, is that that negative. 2 pi i to the n 
it's not a problem for me because we just have to change the variable. You just, you know, have a new variable, let's say z equals negative two pi i uh, zeta, right? And it's just a variable in z. So it's exactly the generating functions I looked up today. They'll just be in, you know, not in, not in zeta, they'll be in uh, z equals negative two pi i zeta. Now, I mean, what's disturbing me a little bit is that, you know, we're, we're, I'm asking you a very specific question of when the moments determine the generating function, but so what if they don't, you know, like you could still have a generating, I mean, you could still, I mean, it, and, and there was the moments that determine the weight, not the generating function, but the weight. Um, you can have interesting ways where the moments don't determine the weight. I well, think. I think I think what 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 you what you're saying uh, that's was I was missing, and you'll be able to look at that with me, like look at those answers I got. But uh, uh, it, they don't see. I have the weights. Let's see. I have the weights, but the generating function look different. But that's because the generating function is basically the uh, Fourier transform. See, and and instead of zeta, like maybe the variable to use would be let's say like. Uh, Theta, because see, then it becomes like clear, like it's an angle, you know, like negative two pi i theta for for a primitive like me. See, so then um, then that theta will. Um... Hmm. Do we have more on this? This is the this is the conclusion. Or this is I, it. This is all like I that? you know. I I I spent I spent a little bit of time thinking about it since our last. I maybe our oh, meeting. This is with perfect. Tom. And but then, can I show yeah. you? Can I show you my? Um, can I show yeah. you my? Yeah. Um, um, but Anders, I'm getting. You know, I have a I have a meeting coming up in about 15 okay. minutes. Um, so maybe you know. We could do maybe, it next time then. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe it's best about next time. Should we stop the recording? Yeah, let's stop. Thank you. I want to thank. Uh, I want to thank John Harlan for teaching me this, and then I want to um, look forward to the future. Please like, subscribe this video and uh, support me through Patreon. This is Math for Wisdom. Okay, so I think, yeah, I think we're- That was see. fantastic. Okay, yeah, that was fun. Um, okay. and yeah, I, I, you know, I, nothing was polished there, but you know, that's- No, it was very good. It was very okay. good. You're, you're a great okay. teacher and I hope that somebody appreciates you the way I do. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom. Because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.